we start here, a little theory for the roboticists. My name is uh, Joan Sola. I work at the Institute of Robotics in Barcelona. I made uh, my PhD some years ago in France and my in Toulouse. My topic is uh, state estimation for robotics. Um, I have been doing SLAM, odometry, using vision, uh, LiDAR, uh, eye amused, any kind of sensors. And so uh, Lee theory, I have been using it uh, recently for state estimation. Uh, this theory can be used for many other things, but in my in this course, um, there is a certain bias towards state estimation. Um, uh, but the same concepts can be used for robot control, um, uh, planification, or planning. I mean, or even to to model any nonlinear spaces that you have in your in your problems. Maybe for deep learning also, it, it can be used. But uh, as said, uh, it will be somewhat biased to my speciality, which is state estimation. Okay, let's start. I will start with uh, with an example so that you can grasp what are the main points of interest uh, in the theory. Uh, touching the things that you should know, it's about uh, how it works the complex uh, plane. For this, I will be using um, a whiteboard or a blackboard actually uh, to share with you. So, okay, let's go to the complex plane. So in this plane, we have complex numbers that I will call Z, okay? And my interest is in those Zs that have unit norm. Let's say the norm of Z is equals to one, okay? That, um, can, I, can you see the, my pointer moving around or just the result yes. of my draw? Yes, we can see the pointer. Okay, that's very nice. Okay, so um, so now we have this condition, modulus of z equal to one. Um, what is the interest is of, of this set of uh, complex numbers for ro robotics? So it's actually, this is a rotation group. It's able to rotate vectors in the plane. So if I take any z of unit norm, and I multiply by a vector x, I obtain a vector y. And if vector x is this one here, okay, that's x. Now, vector y will be the vector x rotated the amount specified by vector z. This amount is this angle here, theta. So this angle here will be added here, and I will obtain a vector y. Okay, not so bad, which is here, okay, and which has the same norm of x, because the norm of z is one, so y has the same norm as x. And so um, what happened with z is that it performed a transformation on x producing y. So z rotated x producing y. You can think of x, y, and z as, as three vectors in the complex plane, of course, but in Lie theory, we are not interested in this. We are interested in looking at x, y as two elements of the complex plane, and z is an operator, or it's an element of another set which is the circle, okay? See that X and Y can escape the circle, but Z has to stay on the circle. So Z is one kind of, one kind of object, and X and Y are other kinds of objects, okay? All right, so um, how does this work? Um, so we have um, uh, elements of one set, which is the circle, and elements of another set, which is the plane, okay? And we are interested in this set here. This set is a group, okay? And in particular, it's a Lie group. This course is about explaining what is a Lie group and how it works. 
and how can how can we use it for for robotics okay so um we have seen uh, a number of um interesting things uh defining a league group one is the underlying space sorry for the writing which is the complex plane the other one is a constraint a constraint which in this case is modulus of z equal one and this gives you a subgroup of the complex plane which is this subgroup here which we call s1 okay and that's the lee group in this case is the circle in the plane s1 comes from sphere of dimension one this has one degree of freedom you can only move on the line and it's a sphere of one degree of freedom that's called s1 okay and uh, we have seen the action which is rotate okay and we will see more things about this um, this Lee group in a few minutes but i would like you to retain especially the constraint and the action the constraint is defining the shape of the group in this case is a circle okay and it's a nonlinear constraint, as you can see, modulus of z equal one is a nonlinear constraint. And the action is the power of this group. It can, it can transform elements of other sets, okay? That's very interesting because in robotics, for example, we want to move things and how we move or how much we move, that's the Lie group objects that move. But what we move, that's a point in space or a vector in space, that's the other set. Um, before going on, uh, I would like to motivate a little bit why do we want Lie theory for robotics. Uh, it is proper. It means that we can perform rigorous calculus. Um, calculus means uh, to make derivatives and integrals on nonlinear spaces. Uh, okay, that's proper. It's a theory that allows us to work properly in here. Uh, it is powerful. It means that we can handle uncertainties uh, or small increments, optimization steps, all these kind of things we use in estimation or in optimization or even in control to, to modify our, our variables. Imagine a variable is a rotation matrix in 3D, that's nine numbers, and you have to modify it in some direction. You cannot just modify randomly these nine numbers because only three degrees of freedom are allowed to move these nine numbers. So how do you handle this reduction from nine degrees of freedom to three? There are six constraints put here. Um, it's, it's not trivial. And uh, Lie theory is there to make it um, proper. And so, and so it's powerful because it allows you to do these kind of things. Uh, a third uh, reason, it's abstract. It means that once you start grasping the concepts and the methods uh, in the Lie theory, you can apply them exactly in many cases. For example, 2D and 3D follow the same things, the same rules, the same mechanisms. Um, rotations or rigid motions, they follow the same kind of things. If you have been sometimes in discussions about what is best, a quaternion or a rotation matrix, when you go to Lie groups, you realize it's the same thing, so you don't need to discuss anymore. And if you uh, ever mm, have a problem or have a project involving, for example, IMUs for your motion sensors, and you have some notions about odometry, you can make a lot of uh, connections between these two ways of integrating motion. Okay, so. Uh, because it is abstract, once you are able to abstract the concepts to this abstract layer, you can think much better on robotics problems in a, in a wider scope. Okay, not one problem at a time, but all, all of them at, at the same time. And finally, uh, because it's beautiful, I would like you to agree with this at the end of this course. So if, if, you, if some of you agree with point four, I will be very happy at the end of this course. Um, so, 
This course will touch the following topics. Uh, presentation, it's already done about the complex numbers. I will define the Lie group uh, as a manifold and a group, also the action of this group. I will get, then go to the tangent space, very important because the group is nonlinear, the tangent space is linear. And because it is linear, we can do calculus. Okay, we can make derivatives and integrals in this space. Um, I will uh, explain the exponential map. It's a scary word, um, but uh, quite intuitive once, once it is explained. It's the way to transfer points from the tangent space to the group. And of course, the logarithmic map, which is the inverse, will transfer points from the group to the tangent space. I will define some handy operators, which are just shortcuts for some tools that are already defined, which are the plus and minus operators. Then if I am good in time, I will introduce the adjoint. But this is a kind of secondary topic that if I am a bit late, I will skip point six, the adjoint. Um, and then we will go on explaining how to uh, define derivatives on Lie groups, how to handle uncertainty, covariances, matrix, um, I don't know, uncertainty propagation through nonlinear functions, these kind of things. Um, point nine, I will not touch it because I have seen my presentation, it's probably a little bit too long. Uh, maybe if I have time at the end, I, I introduce it. Integration means how do you integrate motion steps. So you move a little bit, what's your new position? You move a little bit more, what's your next position? Okay, that's integration. And then um, uh, I prepared from these two examples, I prepared the first one, which is localization of a robot um, in, a, in an area where, where, where uh, landmarks are. Okay. Um, before going into the hard work, uh, so this course uh, will introduce a, lo a lot of new topics. On the right, you see a number of words that probably you don't know, but on the on the left, you should see uh, terms and concepts that you should know. Um, complex plane, transformations, rotations, these kind of things, vector spaces, the Jacobian matrix, you should know what it is and be more or less comfortable with this kind of matrices. Covariances, matrices, the same thing. And it will be very nice if you know Kalman filter because the example at the end of the course is a Kalman filter. And I would not like to explain the Kalman filter because it would take too much time. So, but it's only for the end example. So if you never work with Kalman filters, you can still follow the 90% or 95% of this course without any issue. The other known topics, um, I would say you should be more or less um, comfortable with them. Okay. Okay. Um, also, so that you have some, some support, of course, we will share these slides with you. But in the meantime, um, we made a paper about two years ago about everything that I'm going to explain here. Uh, it has like 17 pages, a lot of figures and a lot of examples. So it's uh, the purpose of that paper is, is didactical. And I will be following in this course more or less the same, the same path as in the paper. So the paper, I think it's a good support for this course. Um, uh, we also have a C++ uh, library which works uh, the same as Eigen. It's very, very um, uh, powerful. And you can find it here in the link. And then for, for the last part of the, of the course where I start talking about Jacobians and these kind of things, there are a myriad of formulas that you are not supposed to remember. I don't remember. So we have a cheat sheet of a lot of formulas related to Lie theory for most of the groups that we are going to be using in uh, in robotics okay so let's start what is a group so a group is a set of elements uh, with an operation okay and uh, this set with this operation to be a group it has to fulfill four axioms 
So if you take two elements of the group, x, y, and you operate them together with the operator, the result is a member of the group also. OK? Um, the group has an element called the identity, so that if you operate any member with the identity, you get the same member. Not very surprising. Um, the group also has, for each member x, it has an inverse, which is also in the group. Of course, when you operate the inverse with the, so x minus 1 times x, you obtain the identity, right? And then a last, um, a last axiom, which is less obvious or less uh, intuitive, but it's necessary for, for this set and operation to be a group, is that this operation is associative, OK? Associative means exactly that you can um, change the order of the operations, and the result is the same, OK? Um, very important, many groups have this operator, which is non-commutative. So x times y is not exactly is not the same as y times x. This is very important. Okay, many gr uh, some groups, uh, the easy groups, or I call them sometimes the trivial groups, are commutative, but they are the least interesting. And the interesting groups are very quickly non-commutative. Okay, that's that's many times we say properties of something. That's the four axioms. And we don't say the non-properties. <laughs> so non-commutativity is not a property. It's the lack of a property. But uh, it's good that you are aware that this property is not uh, necessary to have a group. OK. So some examples. For example, the integers are a group under addition. If you add integers together, you get integers. Each one of these integers has an inverse. And uh, this operation is associative. And you have an identity, which is 0. So you have the four axioms for integers under addition. No problem. If you want to take the integers under multiplication, you will fulfill some of the axioms. The identity, for example, is 1. But you don't have the inverse, because, for example, four, the inverse of 4 is not an, in an integer. So the integers under multiplications do not form a group. Um, uh, these are discrete groups. Um, you, you can take this, this example of the triangles. You, you can find it in YouTube or in many places. It's, it's quite illustrative. Um, so if you have upright triangles and you rotate them 120 degrees, you obtain an upright triangle. Okay. If this rotation you represent it by uh, another upright triangle, then you can multiply upright triangles and obtain up upright triangles. So the upright triangles form a group, but it's discrete. Only six elements exist in this group. You can rotate or you can flip them um, along uh, the symmetry axis. OK, that's an example. That's uh, not very related to our curves, but so that you know what's a group, more or less. Let's see continuous groups, more interesting for us. The real numbers under addition, it's a continuous group. Um, under multiplication, if you accept the zero, it's also a, a continuous group. The complex numbers, as we have seen, it's also a group. And also the unit complex numbers. Um, I put it in red because this one is interesting for us. The other ones are just cool groups, no problem. But they are not, not, we are not covering it or we don't use them as, as they are. OK, unit complex numbers are very nice under multiplication. Uh, not under addition. If you add two unit complex numbers, usually you don't get a unit complex number. So unit complex numbers are not group under addition. Uh, you can also have square invertible matrices. So if you take two square matrices and multiply them together, you get a square matrix. The matrix product is associative. You have the identity, which is the identity matrix. And you have the inverse, because you said it that these matrices are invertible. So that makes a group under multiplication. And also, of course, the rotation matrices that I also put it in color, because we use them a lot in robotics, as you know. Next. 
what is a Lie group? So, so far we covered groups, discrete and continuous. Now, what is a Lie group? A Lie group is a group that is also a smooth manifold. So, a manifold can be defined in a mathematical way through infinitely derivative and so on. But I would prefer you to grasp the visual um, intuition behind a manifold. A manifold is like a surface that you can bend. Okay, for example, if you take a blanket and cover something with it, the shape of this blanket is a manifold, right? Um, and so we can distinguish two kinds of manifolds, the smooth manifolds and the non-smooth manifolds. The non-smooth manifolds may have edges or spikes, so places where the derivative is broken, okay? These are non-smooth manifolds. We will put them out of our way because we are not interested in these guys and we will keep only the smooth manifolds. I, I hope this blue drawing is enough for you to get what is a manifold, okay? The unit circle I draw um, some minutes ago is a manifold. It's just a line in, in one dimension embedded in the space of two dimensions. And if you follow this line, you will never get a spike or an edge. It is a smooth manifold. Okay, um, so uh, more modern definitions of uh, Lie groups reverse the order of these two um, concepts, group and smooth manifold, and say that a Lie group is a smooth manifold whose elements satisfy the group axioms. So whatever, okay, you can start with a group and then add the manifold, or you can start with the manifold and add the group properties. You get the same, the same thing, all right? So that's a Lie group. Here is um, a table where you will find um, most of the Lie groups used in robotics. The list is not exhaustive, but uh, the most used groups are here. So the first one, the ND vector. Um, can you see my, my pointer? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, the ND vector um, or the group of, uh, of, uh, of vectors in the n-dimensional space under addition, that's a group. And we can use it for translation, for example. That could be the translation group as opposed to the rotation group. That, that would be a translation. You have a point, you add a vector and you go somewhere else. That's a translation, okay? It's a trivial group. The constraint, uh, it's, it's, it's trivial, uh, V minus V equals zero. Of course, that, that's no, no constraint, okay? Um, these uh, columns in orange will be explained later on in the course. So the tangent space has two forms. We'll, we will talk about this quite largely later. We have the exponential map, okay? And the last two columns are the composition, so V1 plus V2, and the action. If we want to translate a point X, we just add a V to it and we go somewhere else, okay? Um, this is the second group of, uh, <laughs> the second group of groups, of Lie groups, uh, is defined for the two-dimensional space. You have the circle group, which we have seen some minutes ago. This is the rotation group in the plane represented by complex numbers, unit complex numbers, okay? The constraint is z conjugate times z equals one. That imposes norm one, all right? The product is the composition rule and the action is also done by the product. So the composition rule is the complex product and the action is also the complex product. This happens a lot, but not always. The rotation matrix, SO2, uh, a special orthogonal matrix of dimension two, um, uh, it has one degree of freedom. It's in a space of four dimensions because matrices, uh, two by two matrices has four numbers. The symbol is probably a capital R. The constraint is R transpose R equals I. And I would like you to notice the similarity of this equation with the previous one, okay? You change Z by R, you change conjugate by transpose and Y one by identity. And you say, wow, this is kind of the same thing. Okay. 
um, composition is matrix product and uh, action is matrix times vector product, which is the same as the matrix product. Uh, you also know for sure the rigid motions. It's combining rotations and translations with this kind of matrices. Okay. Um, the constraint only exists for the rotation part. There are no constraints for the translation part and, and so on. The composition is the product and the action is a translation plus a rotation. That's the rigid motion group action. Okay. It's no longer a matrix product. It's a little bit more involved. You should know these things. There's no, no, new, no new things here. The, the third block is the same thing for 3D. Okay? And so rotation and rigid motion follow the same thing. Just from SO, uh, SO2, we go to SO3 and so on. And the equivalent of the unit complex numbers in the plane is the quaternions, okay? So quaternions have four numbers and three degrees of freedom. That's the constraint, unit norm, which is of course very similar to this one up here. And the composition is a product, a quaternion product, which needs to be defined properly. But the action is a double product, Q, X, Q conjugate. That's the way you rotate a vector X. All right, um, just a quick overview so that you know that if you are able to think about all these things with a single theory, I think you get better in, in, your, in your projects. You can think better about what you want to do and how do you want to achieve that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the group action. So a group can act on another set V to transform its elements. All right, so a rotation matrix acts on vectors to rotate those vectors, right? So given two elements in the group, you can think of them as two rotation matrices, R and Q, for example, and a vector V in V. The action, which I represent here by a dot, is such that if you apply the identity element to the second element, this doesn't move. That makes a lot of sense. If you apply the identity matrix uh, as a rotation to a vector, this vector is not rotating. That's no problem. And the second one is compatibility. So if you first compose the two group elements and then apply the action to V, that must be the same as applying the action first to this element Y. And then that's, that's an element of the set V because it's an action. And then we apply the second action X to the result of this. These two parts need to be equal. If they are not, this is not called an action. This is some other thing, okay? So these are the two axioms for the action as, as well as we had four axioms for the Lie group or for the group, okay? And just for some background, uh, Lie groups were created in late 18th century and at that time, uh, they were called continuous transformation groups. Okay, so it's a group that is able to transform some of the things and it's continuous. And this led to Lie group terminology and the manifolds and the smooth manifolds and these kind of things, which are more mathematical terms. Okay. So, um, so far, I think um, you have an idea of why do we need these Lie groups and what pieces in robotics are, are actually Lie groups, even if you didn't know. So rotation matrices, motion matrices, and so on. So how can we work with all these elements, which are usually nonlinear, you know, rotations and these kind of things are nonlinear elements. And how can you um, work with them? The first uh, thing to do is at each point on the manifold, let me represent the manifold by this black curved surface. In this case, it's a 2D surface. Uh, most of the manifolds are more than 2D, but I cannot draw them on the board. So every drawing that I will be making, it's a 2D manifold, but quaternions are 3D manifolds and so on, okay? 
um, I will put the letter M for manifold. And I will try to use, um, usually when there is only one point in this manifold, it will be called X. Okay, X is a point in the manifold, all right? And then on X, I can place a tangent space. That's a flat sur surface, completely planar, that touches M on the point X and doesn't touch anywhere else. It's a tangent, okay? You know what's the idea of tangent? Um, this tangent space will appear in this course for a while. Uh, don't forget this graphical uh, point of view, which was very, very clear. So that's the tangent space. It's just tangent to your surface, which was not flat. And the tangent space is flat. Uh, because it's flat, um, it's a vector space. So the manifold is not a vector space, but the tangent space is a vector space. So um, because the manifold has no edges or no spikes, it means that at any point, there is only one tangent space. All right? And then, because the manifold has the same structure everywhere, if this is a 2D surface, so it will be always a 2D surface, all the tangent spaces at every point are equal. They are not the same plane, but they are all planes. OK? Um, it's, a tangent, it's a vector space, this is already said. And then the dimension of this tangent space, in this case 2D, uh, defines the dimension of the Lie group. The Lie group or manifold M, it's 2D, OK? The number of degrees of freedom. And we have a special tangent space for the group M is the tangent space at the identity element, OK? Because the identity element is special, there is one tangent space that, that is special, and is this one. And it's called the Lie algebra, OK? So you will have the Lie group and the Lie algebra, OK? Uh, the Lie algebra is the tangent space at the origin. I, I will switch between origin and identity, depending on how do I approach this, this thing. But the identity and the origin is the same point. OK. Um, let's see um, uh, how do we uh, go into uh, identifying what is the shape of the tangent space. Let's start by putting some clear elements. That's number one. This is the identity of the group. OK. And a tangent space on this point, let's go. OK, um, let's go this way. So this space is a line, it's a straight line, is tangent to the point 1. So this is the Lie algebra of this group. OK, the Lie algebra of C, we will call it small c. Oops, sorry, small c. OK. Um, of course, if you have any other point on the circle, you will have a different tangent space. OK? So if this is point, this is point z, then that's the tangent space at z. OK? So um, very usually, the tangent space is defined as the velocity of z. So if z is a point that is moving on this circle, OK, its velocity, it's tangent to the circle, right? So we can say that this vector is z. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's z dot. OK, that's, I think, quite clear. We would like to know what is the algebraic form of z dot? What, what does it look like? So to do so, I will be using this, this technique, um, algebraic technique. Let's, let's start like this. Let's start by the constraint defining the manifold. That's the constraint defining the manifold. And let's take the derivative with respect to time. That goes like this. Uh, 
that's the chain rule well not the, the derivative of the product so if i take the derivative of this equation i get this other equation okay now let's rearrange this a little bit um let's say that z conjugate z dot equals minus z dot conjugate z and let's manipulate this a little bit more to write it as so okay you know the conjugate of something you have to swap the order and conjugate all the elements and you get here okay now um realize that what is inside here is exactly this okay and so you have that this element is the negative of its own conjugate okay so what elements of the complex plane are equal to minus their own conjugates so the only solution for this is that these elements are purely imaginary let me write this so for any scalar omega or for a given scalar omega this is an imaginary number and this because it's the the negative of its own conjugate needs to be imaginary okay so the tangent space has this form let me make a square here The tangent space has this form. It has one degree of freedom. And if z equals one at the origin, if z equals one, we have, of course, this. And this is the form of the Lie algebra. Okay. Of course, z dot is not imaginary, z dot here, because it goes a little bit to the left. But this is because it's multiplied by z conjugate on the top. Okay, so we could have z dot. Let me. This is only true in this case. Otherwise, z dot is z times i times omega. Okay, that's the general case. This will be very important after a few minutes because integrating this this is a differential equation integrating this, this equation will lead us to the exponential map okay but not yet all right so that you know but not yet all right so we have the shape of the tangent space Uh, or the Lie algebra, which is the same at the origin. All right, let's go back. Okay, I have another example for the group of rotation matrices. I think I will do it a little bit later. It follows the same the same logic. Okay, you apply the constraint R transpose times R equals I. This is should be an equal, and you get the rotation matrices. Um, Okay, let me uh, go for the first time a little bit abstract. Okay, uh, now uh, from here, I will show you um, what happens in more dimensions and in an abstract way. Uh, let me see if I can convey you some useful information from here. Let's, let's start with the manifold. In this case, uh, it's a sphere in 3D. Okay. I hope you can see it. The dimension of the surface of this sphere. Remember, the manifold is the surface. It's not the solid, OK? Just the points on the surface belong to the manifold. And this is a 2D surface, correct? Let's draw the origin. So. The origin is not in the center of the sphere because the center of the sphere is not part of the manifold. The origin is a particular point in the manifold. 
Okay, the origin or the identity element. Okay, let's now draw the tangent space to this point or at this point to the manifold. Okay, if you can see, I have to move it so that you can grasp the 3D, um, the visually, the, the 3D visual part. Okay, so I think this vision of the manifold and its tangent space is quite powerful. You will always have this. Of course, you have to abstract. Um, you have to make an abstraction of your manifold into a sphere. But who cares? It's a surface that touches in one point here and that rolls over itself. It's actually, why not a sphere? Um, you can go to more dimensions, like four-dimensional spheres or five-dimensional and so on. Aquaturnian is a in a space of four dimensions is the three-dimensional spherical surface. That's the quaternion group, okay? Because I cannot draw in more dimensions than here, I have to limit to this representation. I want you to, um, to observe the concepts that we are explaining in this drawing. Let's now draw some vectors on this tangent space, okay? Let's draw some vectors. Okay, these are vectors in the tangent space. I, I hope you can hear, you can see them clearly. They depart from the origin and they go different directions. Okay, they are quite canonical, but it can go in any direction and in any length. These vectors are not unit vectors. These are elements of the tangent space, not elements of the group. They can have any norm. Okay, they can have 27 kilometers long, no problem. Let's see what happens with these vectors when we apply the exponential map that I will explain later. But I want you to see what is the exponential map before I explain it. So what happened is that each one of the vectors wrapped the surface of the manifold. OK, I think you can see it. Each one of them wrapped the manifold following what is called the geodesic. The geodesic is the biggest circle you can do on a, on a sphere, okay? So I think it should be possible for you to, um, to see what I want to show you. So this point here, okay, it's on the manifold, the end of the yellow, curve is a point here, okay? This point came from the tangent space here by wrapping, can you imagine this is a string and this is a ball and you just wrap the ball with this string. This point ends up here, okay? So if this point is called, let me call it A, this is the exponential of A. And if this point here is called X, this point here is the logarithm of x. So exponential and logarithm, you can go from the tangent space to the manifold anytime you want. This is an exact operation. It's perfectly fine to go from here to there. It's not an approximation or it's nothing like this. So it's exact. So I will remember a little bit. Each point on this manifold represents one element of the group. For example, this point here is a 3D rotation matrix, okay? <laughs> this point here is a 3D rotation matrix. This point here, it can be, for example, a, a 3D rotation vector. You know, uh, you define an axis of rotation and then the modulus of the vector, you make it equal to the angle that you rotated. With that, you constructed a rotation vector. So the exponential of this rotation vector is the rotation matrix that performs exactly the same rotation, okay? Um, this is very important. I think this is the most important part of this course. If you don't get this point, I think you will miss what it comes later, okay? Exponential, logarithm. Tangent space is a vector space. The manifold is a nonlinear surface, okay? If you want to do calculus on this surface, which is 
um, nonlinear. For example, you take the derivative of a point here, the result is out of the manifold. Okay, so each time you take a derivative, you are out of the manifold. However, you can stay on the tangent space for, for doing these operations because derivatives and integrals in the tangent space, which is, which is linear, are well defined. Um, let's see if I have anything else to show you. Ah, okay, okay. Very often, um, for example, you can see now that the blue line made exactly half a turn and ended up here. Right. If you take any other of the lines and make exactly half a turn, you will and you will end up here in the same point. That's the antipodal point to the origin. So any vector which has length pi will end up here when you take the exponential. Right. And so um, if you go beyond this point and you take the logarithm. You could go the same way you came, and you would end up out of this circle. Or you can make the logarithm the other way around and end up closer to the origin. So the tangent space will cover the manifold multiple times. And the first time it covers is the time where it's this circle here, this, the radius is pi. And so it will end up, all these points in this circle, in the red circle, will end up here at the, at the antipodal point. This, we call it the first cover of the manifold by the tangent space. Mm, not very important. Of course, it's a fact uh, you need to know, but it's not important for the development of this course. Okay? What is important is this vision of the topology of the Lie group and the tangent space uh, with inclusion of the tang uh, exponential and logarithmic maps. All right, let's go back. And so let's uh, let's talk about this. The tangent space um, at the origin is called the Lie algebra, and we use t. Uh, maybe you can see now my pointer. The Lie algebra t e m. What is this? Is the tangent space to m at the identity element, which I call e. Okay, that's a normal terminology, and for for Lie theory, it's the tangent space to m. M is the manifold at the point e. Okay, and um, I will show you now because this is a vector space that you can have a second representation of this tangent space as a regular um, r to the power of m space, a regular vector space, which I call a Cartesian vector space. And between these two spaces, which are isomorph, it means that they have the same form. Maybe they are represented by different elements, but uh, there is a linear map from one to the other one. So you can go from Rm to Tem with this operation that I call hat. Okay, I will explain this in one minute. But you have hat that goes from Rm to Tem. Okay and V, which goes from TEM to RM. TEM or RM are the same vector space, but with two different uh, representations. Um, we write this as follows. TEM is, uh, this is called, is isomorph to RM, okay? And of course, the elements of TEM are, are isomorph to the elements of RM. Um, I will use a hat for the elements of TEM, the Lie algebra, and a regular letter for the elements of the Cartesian space, which are just vectors. Okay? These elements are simpler. This is just a vector. These elements are a little bit more involved. Okay? The tangent space for the complex plane was I theta, and I is the imaginary unit number. So that would be W hat for the complex plane, I theta. But it has only one degree of freedom. You represent it by theta in the real in the real line. Okay. Let me put an example for S O three is the space, the Lie group of rotation matrices in three D. Okay. The um, 
elements of the Lie algebra are skew symmetric matrices. Okay, and because they are skew symmetric, they have three degrees of freedom. Okay, the diagonal is zero, and each element opposite in the diagonal is the same with the sign changed. Right? So th there are three degrees of freedom. You can build this matrix that we usually write in SO3 as uh, bracket, letter, bracket, subindex X. Okay? You can write it as a linear combination of three base matrices, EX, EY, EZ. Okay? And you can write um, uh, dot, uh, omega cross as a linear combination of these three elements. All right. And once you've done this, it's very simple to say, OK, let's represent the tangent vector just as a regular Cartesian vector with these three coordinates. I hope you can see the benefit of this. It's very much easier to work with these elements than to work with these elements. OK. Uh, be careful, it's not the same. This is a matrix, this is a vector. For example, you can multiply these two matrices together if you have two of them. You cannot multiply two vectors together or depending on what you do, it makes no sense, okay? In this case, the matrix product here is equivalent to the cross product of vectors here. These two spaces are completely equivalent. They are called isomorph and they are two ways of representing the same element of the tangent space. Okay, let me go back here. This is the same thing, two ways of representing them. One is very practical because it's regular vectors. The other one, it's a little bit weird and we have to pay attention of how to manipulate it. And it will be also very different depending on the Lie group that you are. But because you can also always go to a Cartesian RM space, any Lie group will have an RM tangent space, which is a vector, okay, a Cartesian vector. You can go from one to the other with the isomorphisms hat from, for, for going from Cartesian to Lie algebra or V for going from Lie algebra to Cartesian. No big deal, okay. Um, we can go on. Let's see what happens uh, now. How do we end up in the exponential map? This is a little involved, but I will explain it very easily for the unit complex numbers. And then uh, maybe I make an extension to another Lie group so that you can see that I follow the same steps. Okay, this one. All right, let's start. Let's start by the constraint again. This derived in this equation. Now let me let me change a little bit. We have seen this before. Um, and this derives to the following the following <clears throat> differential equation. Okay. So um, what is the integral of this equation? So it's like that, z of t equals z zero times exponential of i omega. Okay, if you, if you don't believe me, just take the derivative of this. For example, uh, let's take the derivative of this thing here uh, with respect to, oh, sorry, I forgot, I forgot t. Here. Let me see if I can put it here. Okay. Let's take the time derivative of this guy to show you that we are fine.
That's the chain rule. So this last term is just the derivative of the what is inside the exponential, and the derivative of constant times function is the same thing, and the derivative of the exponential is the same exponential times the derivative of what's inside with respect to t. Okay, and so this is z t, and so that's perfectly z times i times omega as is required by the condition. So this condition comes from the constraint and what happens to the velocity of this constraint, okay? So, um, so you see the exponential, it comes very easily just from this fact. Um, now let me apply a little manipulation, let's say exp of i omega t equals um, z zero conjugate z of t. And let's call this guy z. I mean, this is an element of the group. This is another element of the group. This is a product of two elements of the group. And because it's a group, this is an element of the group. Let me call it just z. And so we have that any point z in the group can be computed as the exponential of a point in the tangent space. Okay. I omega t belongs to the tangent space. All right. Okay. Now, um, of course, uh, this is just uh, an expression. Exponential, as you know, is a fundamental function. In this case, the tangent space is the, comp uh, not the complex, but the Im imaginary numbers. So we have to know how to compute this. Okay. Um, so now this development will be valid for mostly every group. Of course, you don't conjugate always. Sometimes you transpose or do other things. But the development is quite the same every, every time. But now, if you want a closed form for this, uh, now this, this depends exactly on which group you are operating. Okay, let's take a closed form of this. Let's define to start um, omega t equals theta. Okay, omega is the angular velocity, t is time. And at a particular time, we have uh, advanced an angle theta. Okay, theta is omega t. So that I can write a little bit less. And let's also um, put that i to the power zero is one. i to the power one is i. i to the power two is minus one. i to the power three is minus i. i to the power four is one. And you can see that increasing power of i will circulate the unit circle at the points 1, i, minus 1, minus i, and then 1 again. So this sequence, you can extend it to <laughs> as much as you want, even on the left. And um, you just make turns to this circle by doing so. So why is this important? Because now let's let's um, let's write this expression as follows. Let me go. Wait a second. Let me go a little bit lower. Uh, let's say that z equals x of oops of i theta, and this let's put it as the sum from n equals zero to infinity of the Taylor expansion. So this is i theta to the power n divided n factorial, okay? And now look what happens. Uh, for n equals zero, this is one. For n equals one, this is i theta. For n equals two, this is, um, Let's go one, 
2 i theta square. And let's put another term, 1, 3 factorial i theta cube. Okay? And now, and of course, you go to infinity. Now, um, let's write again this. Now you have i square here, so that's minus one half of theta square. You have i cube here, so it's minus i one three factorial theta cube. And then you will have plus uh, one four factorial theta four plus so, 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 okay? And now it, you can see that every two elements you have a real number, and every other element is a pure imaginary number. Okay, let's group the real numbers first. One plus one half uh, theta square plus dot 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 plus i theta plus one three factorial theta cube. That's that's minus. Sorry, and that's that's minus. Excuse me for this, plus dot, dot, dot. And I'm nearly over. This term here is the cosine of theta. Plus i. And this term here is the sine of theta. OK? So you end up here, something that you already knew, but we got here by going all the way, which means applying the constraint of the group and developing and going on until we get here. Of course, the norm of this guy is one. And of course, you, can, you knew that a uh, uh, unit um, complex number of norm one can be expressed as the cosinus of theta plus i sinus of theta. For the complex number, this has a relative interest for you, but the method is the same that we can use in all other Lie groups, and that's the good point of it. Okay, let me um, let me stay in this level, in this level here. Okay, see this formula here. All right, let me go up. No, we will lose it. Okay. Uh, let's stay here. Let's take a new circle here. Oops. Excuse me. I'm really not very used to these tools. Let's write a new circle. All right. Now let's put one and zero, okay? And let's see this sum here. Let's see this sum here. And let's imagine that uh, theta, theta is this angle, theta, okay? So let's take the first term, first term, we go from zero to one, one. Now we add in the direction of i, we add theta. We go up, let's, let's use another color, green. Okay, so we've been here. We go here, now we go up and we're here, okay. Let's add the third one, it's negative to the left and it's real, okay. Let's go back some amount. We go here. Uh, we have this one. Now let's take this one. It's negative i, so we go down. And it's theta cube, whatever it goes. And three factorial, OK? This factorial is going to be very powerful in a few seconds because these numbers will get small and small. So we go down. Let's go down. We go here. Now let's think about the next one. It's a real number positive. So we go that way. And 
this will roll over itself, okay, and it will end up here. Do you see that? And that's the exponential of theta. If I can draw it again, Let's make a circle. Let's make theta here. And let's draw the result of the exponential, which is go here. And that's z. OK. This um, graphical um, representation of the exponential which means I will roll this straight vector over the surface to get this point. This is the exponential map. OK, very important that you retain not only actually, not only all this math here. OK, why not? All right. The nice thing of this math is the method, not exactly every detail. And I also want you to retain this graphical thing. This is a piece of string that is rolling over this curved surface. Okay. And the arc here has the same length as the string because it's a string. All right. If you pull it, it doesn't pull. <laughs> it's the same length. Right. Okay. So, uh, so far for the exponential map, of course, we can define the logarithmic map. Um, don't know if I'm going to do it, but why not? It's just inverting this expression. So you can always find i theta equals log of z. And the shape of this, um, you need to go for um, probably the tangent minus 1 of uh, Of course, you go here with sinus theta, cosinus theta. No big deal. I mean, once you have the exponential, you just invert and find the logarithmic map, which is the inverse. OK, uh, just I want to put it here, the logarithmic map. It takes the point and goes to the tangent space. OK, that's the log also very important all right i think it's clear let me see what time is it okay let's go on so i will have to speed up a bit and, and jump over some areas but um this is already explained the x the um Tangent space has two forms. And so we can define an exponential map, which we, we call it capital, that goes the two steps at once. So first, you go from Cartesian vector to Lie algebra, and then you apply the exponential. Or you define a new function, which goes all the way in one go. No big deal. It's just a shortcut. But it's very useful because we want to stay here at the Cartesian level. We want to stay here for everything related to the tangent space. And we want to go to the manifold in one go. OK, so that's a shortcut for these two blue steps. Of course, the logarithm is also a shortcut for the two red steps. All right. OK, with this now, um, uh, two important operators that will be the basis of uh, the definition of the derivative that we will uh, introduce in a few minutes. OK, so we have a group. We have the composition rule. x1 times x2 gives you this point here, x1 times x2. And we have the exponential function. If you have a tangent vector and you exponentiate it, you end up in the group at this point. OK, if you combine these two guys, you can write exactly that this point here is x times the exponential of w. OK, w is here, which is, was x2 before. And so uh, this is correct. No problem. 
And I prefer to draw it like this. So we were at x, then we draw a tangent at x of the magnitude w, and then we roll it over the surface, we wrap the surface, and we get to this point. Okay, x times exponential of w is here. Okay, and to this operation, we call it plus. As simple as that, we call it plus. Why that? Because now we can think about, OK, I had, for example, a rotation matrix. And I perturbate it a little bit. And this little bit is expressed as a 3D vector. OK? And the result is always a rotation matrix if you use this plus. OK? Because what you add, you take the exponential, bring it to the manifold, and then compose it with the previous element, you stay in the manifold. So if you use this plus, you stay on the manifold. This is very important. So you have vectors which are not in the manifold, but you can add them, add them in quotes, to elements of the manifold to get elements, new elements of the manifold. Okay, Very useful for if this is an error over a rotation matrix, or you are doing optimization in, and this is the update step of your optimizer you compute it in the tangent space you compose it like this to your state uh, element okay that's the plus operator of course we can define the minus operator in the reverse way so you have x and y and you want a vector that expresses the difference between x and y that could be an error. For example, you have two rotation matrices. One is the true one, and the other one is the estimated one. And you know there is an error somewhere. And this error, you want it to have three degrees of freedom. okay? Because maybe you want to define a covariance for it. If you have two rotation matrices and you subtract them, <laughs> the result is nothing but a rotation matrix. You have to subtract them with this minus operator which is kind of funny, is the log of x minus 1 times y. Why not? OK, so um, the cap capitalized x pan log with the capital and the plus and minus operator are only shortcuts. There's no new material, no new concept, but shortcuts. Now, every time I see y minus x like this, that's the difference between two elements of a group. And this difference is a vector. That's very cool. And when I see this, this is kind of, uh, this could be a perturbation over an element of a group. The result is another element of the group. Plus and minus, very important. Um, okay, well, that's the, that's the advantages. We will define Jacobians and covariances based on plus and minus, all right? Remember this, maybe this figure here, so that you, you see how you can um, relate these elements, uh, each other. OK, um, because um, I said at the beginning that the composition rule for groups is non-commutative, you can do x plus omega or omega plus x. And the result is not the same, OK? so. You want to define uh, sometimes, usually we, we stay here, x plus omega, and we call it the right plus operator because what you add is on the right, OK? But uh, it's also useful to use the left one sometimes. You put it on the left, and that's the left plus, and the result is not the same. This y here is not the same as this y here, OK? Uh, when you use the right operators, the tangent vector is expressed on the local frame defined by x. Again, if x is a rotation matrix, this vector is defined in the rotated reference frame. However, if you are using left operators, the reference frame of the tangent vector is the global frame. All right? Only when these guys are commutative, these two guys are the same. For example, rotations in the plane, there's no problem. You can turn 45 degrees to the left at any time. You can do it before any other turn or after. The result will be the same because it's commutative. But in 3D, this is not the case. Um, I will jump this section. It's a little bit involved mathematically, 
also conceptually and it's not necessary for the rest of the course. Uh, however, it's very interesting. So if you have time later and, and, and you're interested, uh, you can either ask me or go through the paper and so on. This is an interesting topic, but it's the one I can skip. So I think it's good to skip. We're kind of late. So how can we define now Jacobians only groups? Look at this. If we have vector space, you have the typical Jacobian definition. The derivative of f respect to x is the limit, is this limit. Okay. Then the, a consequence is that you can approximate uh, the f at a point more or less close to x is f of x times the derivative times this uh, small displacement. Okay. That's what we do usually to linearize functions. That's no big deal. Okay. And the way to compute the Jacobian j with this expression, remember that h is a vector, so you cannot divide. This expression is like a notation, but you cannot divide something by a vector. Um, the way you do this is that you write your, your equation with a limit, and you manipulate the numerator until you get this form, matrix times vector. And then this limit is j, and j is your Jacobian. That's the way to, to proceed to compute Jacobians from this formula. So in Lie groups, we do exactly the same. We just change plus by O plus and minus by O minus, OK? And we define a derivative like this. And of course, this, this derivative will map variations of the tangent space of x to variations on the tangent space of f of x, OK? f of x takes a point in the manifold of x and produces a point y, which is usually in another manifold, all right? So this plus is defined for the manifold of x, and this minus, minus is defined for the manifold of f of x, OK? And the way to proceed is the same. You take the definition, and you apply some rules, and you get to the Jacobian j. OK, let me um, show you a little bit graphically what happens. Imagine you have a one-dimensional manifold, M, the blue one, and a one-dimensional manifold, N. You have a point x on M, and your function, f, goes from M to N, and to a point x defines a point f of x, which is this one here. All right? So how do you compute this derivative? So you perturbate x, so you go with tau, then you go to the manifold with plus, that's x plus tau. You take f of this point, you go here, this is f of x plus tau, and now you make the difference from f of x plus tau and f of x. That difference, f of x plus tau minus f of x, is a vector called sigma, OK? So you started with a perturbation vector, tau. You end up with a perturbed vector, sigma. And now your derivative is the limit of sigma over tau, when tau goes to 0, which is quite logical. It's the same that we do in vector spaces. Just changing the plus and minus operators allows us to define these derivatives. If you have more degrees of freedom than 1, uh, it's the same thing, all, only that the drawing, it gets kind of more difficult, OK? Now you have a tangent space which is two-dimensional in this case. You have two canonical um, vectors of the base. And for each direction, you see what is your perturbation. You apply plus, you apply f, you apply minus, and you get this new perturbation vector, which is the dotted one. And then you take the limit when this perturbation goes to 0. OK, now you will follow this line as the limit goes to 0. And at the limit, you have this direction. So j1 is the image of tau1 when tau goes to 0. And that's one of the columns of your Jacobian matrix. No big deal. It's, it's explained also in the paper, and it's 
to be able to explain it properly in this course, I think I need more time. Uh, I think at least that the intuitions are are clear. Okay, that's uh, that's important. Next, perturbations, covariance, cis matrix, and so on. Let's take uh, element x perturbated with a vector v. We know how to do that with the plus operator. Okay, that's the same O plus that I was uh, talking before. That's the perturbated version of x. How will we define the covariance of x? We define it through the covariance of v. The covariance of v is this one, the expectation of v times v transpose. No big deal. That's the covariance of v. And we, if we expand the, the expression of v, uh, we need the operator minus, we get here. Okay. The covariance matrix P is the expectation of x perturbated minus x times x perturbated minus x transpose. And this guy here is a proper covariance matrix, which is defined in the tangent space, is the red ellipse. You know that uh, covariance matrices can be represented by ellipsoids very easily. And so in the group, that would be a probability zone defined by the blue curve, which is completely nonlinear. If you want an expression of this curve, <laughs> you get a little bit crazy. but the one in red is very simple. It's actually the same kind of covariances that you have been <clears throat> using um, all the time. More than this, if you want to propagate this covariance through a function f that takes x here and goes to some other manifold through a function y equals fx, okay? The covariance at the arrival space is propagated like this. If y is equal to f of, or f of x, then the covariance of y is the Jacobian of this function times the original covariance times the Jacobian transpose. If you are more or less used to manipulate covariances through linearization of functions, this is exactly what we do in the vector space case. All right? No difference. All right? And so that allows us to work um, uh, very nicely in in, in Lie groups, exactly the way we work in vector spaces. Um, I have uh, 12 minutes. I don't know if I have time to, to make a little robotics example using all this. And I will try. Maybe the time is over by the time I finish. A robot that is moving in space. OK. This robot is moving. And we have some fixed points in space that we can observe. Okay, we can see this point here. We can this one. We can see it from here. From here, we can see this one and this one. From here, we can also see this one here. And these are at each moment in time as the robot moves, which landmarks I am able to observe. Okay, let's complete this a little bit more like that. Okay, let's also add information about motion. Okay, I have measured this motion maybe by counting uh, the turns of the wheel or anything. Okay, and so this uh, will be our problem. Let's put some names to these guys. These are going to be the landmarks. BK, and these are going to be our states xi, xi plus 1, xi plus 2. Okay, that would be for k equal 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4. And we want to know where the robot is based on the observations of the beacons. All right? So um, the poses of the robot, xi, are just poses. So they are elements of SE2. OK? The beacons are just vectors, which are elements of R2. All right, then the motion model, 
x sorry i have to speak about the control the control u is a vector that gives you how much you advance in x you don't advance in y because it's a wheeled robot and how much do you turn in theta okay and it has a noise noise in the three dimensions okay and this noise has a covariance matrix i will go very quickly here for those who know the kalman filter it will be quite um, illustrative for those who know maybe you will get lost here but let me let me try to to do this um x u square sigma s square sigma theta square Okay. Okay. Um, motion model. How does this robot move? So, if we are at position X and we want to move to position J, we will just add the control. We were at position I, we moved, we now are at position J. No big deal. The Jacobians of this will be computed and in a few seconds um, so that we can build a kind of filter. How can we observe the beacons? YK is X minus one times DK plus noise this noise. Um, sorry, this is W and this is N. This noise, it's another matrix, sigma X square, sigma Y square. Okay. Um, this measurement is uh, where in the space of the robot, in the reference frame of the robot, where is the beacon? Okay. That's why I transformed the beacon from world reference frame to robot reference frame. And this is done by the matrix of the robot inverse. Now you go from global to local reference frame, and that's your measurement. Um, so now we just need to define our common filter. And we will define an error state. the X as the true state minus the estimated state. That's my error. And we will make a common filter to estimate this error. Of course, the covariance of this is similar to what we did before. The expectation of X minus X times X minus X transpose Okay, this we did before. And now we can start our common filter, which goes as follows. Uh, prediction stage, prediction, we have xj estimated equals xi estimated plus uj estimated. That means without noise. And the covariance, at time j is f covariance at time i f transpose plus g um, w g transpose. Now f and g are the Jacobians of the this function here. Let's see. Now we have f and g. Okay. And from this function, the Jacobian obtained will be H. I don't have time to go into the details of this Jacobian, but so that you know. This code I will show you later. It's available in C++, so you can rephrase it um, to, to that code. Okay, now correction. Correction step for the Kalman filter. OK, 
Okay, the innovation, I call it small z equals yk minus the observation functions. Um, the covariance, big Z equals um, H D H transpose plus N. Classical Kalman filter. Um, the Kalman gain is P H transpose Z minus one. Typical Kalman filter. And then the update is x we'll get an update with x plus k times small z you see here the plus z is a vector k times z is a vector and that's the correction you apply to your state which is not a vector and you use plus okay and then the covariance that's no problem. Classical, all the covariances and Jacobians are in the tangent space, so this doesn't change with respect to the classical Kalman filter. But this equation is new because of this. And This equation is new because of this, OK? And the rest of the Kalman filter doesn't have any, any significant alteration. And this is why we could define this operator, all the Jacobians properly, and keep what we know about Kalman filters by abstracting all the Lie theory knowledge into basically into these two operators, plus and minus. OK, um, I think I'm done. Um, um, I took quite quite a long time, but uh, finished. It's now 2 o'clock. Please, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I'm free for you to, to answer your questions. Uh, remember these three pointers here, and we will share also this presentation with you. Thank you very much. Good okay. luck. We have we have a last question. Uh, okay. can, can you read it in the chat? In the chat? Ah, okay. No, I, I have to go to the. To okay, the I read it. I, I read it for you. Uh, can you summarize which is the main advantage of light, of lead theory in robotics? Okay. Um, good question. Um, the so, who is doing this question? Are you doing a state estimation or control or these kind of things? Maybe you can switch on the microphone of the guy who or girl who exposed this question. Ah, OK. Control. OK. Uh, I am in state estimation, as said. But the thing is that you, you will have some variables in your system, notably rotation matrices is the most um, obvious example, that are nonlinear. Nonlinear, I mean that the parameters with which you define the rotation matrix act non-linearly on this rotation matrix. Of course, the rotation matrix is a linear operator to a vector, but the, the, the operator itself is non-linear. OK, um, usually when you uh, speak about uh, errors or uh, increments or variations around these elements, for example, a rotation matrix, uh, if you think about it as a, as a vector, you would like to do R plus uh, delta R, for example. You, you compute it, uh, an increment delta R, and you want to add it to R. But if you compute a delta R, which will be a 3 by 3 matrix, so that you can add it to R, that makes no sense, because for, for two reasons. The first, well, it's actually the same reason. but. Um, the result will not be a rotation matrix. You will break the constraint of the orthogonality of the matrix. And also this vector is, this delta R is nine dimensional. And you know you have three degrees of freedom only to modify R. 
So even in control or in estimation, you would like to modify your variables in the minimal space. And so uh, lead theory through the tangent space allows you to work in the minimal space, but with rigor, without approximations, without the linear uh, approximations of this or that, the exponential map and so on are exact operators. So when you adopt this theory, you, you don't lose anything. You don't lose any precision. You get, you get the exact thing that you want. Um, that's one advantage. And the second one, in my point of view, is that uh, if you have several projects in your, in your research life, you will sometimes be in 2D, sometimes in 3D. Sometimes you will have mixed problems. Sometimes um, you will have a colleague that is using Equaternions, and you were used to rotation matrices. And you know these kind of um, different situations you will encounter. Uh, once you realize that all these um, uh, problems can be understood as a single abstract problem, which is the Lie theory, then I think you you get more intuition of what you can do with your with your problem. Maybe you get nicer solutions. You can even write abstract code to solve abstract problems and then particularize them with little extra code to to particularize your things. So that's that's the advantages in my point of view. Any other question? Okay, I think I will say goodbye. Thanks a lot. Um, it was a bit difficult to do it online. I hope it was not so bad. Um, and I don't know, good luck. Yeah. <laughs>